Dan and Gresh says the world will notice when the church embraces moral purity. We cannot display and adorn ourselves with the gospel when we look as addicted, as broken, as impure, and as ashamed as the rest of the world. This is the Revive Our Hearts podcast for September 23, 2024. I'm Nancy DeMoss. Welcome. contamination would you want in your drinking water? Well, of course, the answer is none. We want to drink water that's 100% pure. In fact, a whole industry has grown up offering bottled water to help meet that need. So how much contamination would you want in your relationships, in your choices, in your thoughts? The truth is a whole lot of people who don't want any impurity in their water are far too content to accept impurity in other areas of their lives. At a past Revive Our Hearts conference, a drama group called Acts of Renewal showed us the danger of allowing impurity to creep into our lives. Let's listen to a few minutes of this drama. So um, how long have you known him? Almost a year. And that was from work? Yes, well, we didn't really know each other at first, but then we got assigned to audit an insurance company together last spring, and whoever thought doing something like that would be fun, but I mean, it was, and with him, it was fun. Turns out, we really connected, like he gets me, and we dri- when I drive on the way to work, we like talk on the phone, and he is right there picking up on how I'm feeling, like over the phone, he is very intuitive, and he makes me laugh, and... <laughs> I just feel like myself again. Well, as opposed to what? (laughs) Well, as opposed to who I've become in this marriage. I mean, you know Jake, he's not exactly a compelling conversationalist. You've even said so. Did I? No, I I think what I meant by that, anyway. So, um, how long have you and Jake been married? Four years. Okay, so that would make it... Right out of college, and Christian college at that. The whole ring by spring pressure, we just got caught up in it, and nobody tells you that who you are in college is not who you're going to be for the rest of your life. And now, I just want so much more out of my life, and Jake wants so little. It is just not working anymore. Does Jake know that this is going on? No, I mean... I've not done anything wrong to have to talk about it. I mean, we just meet up after work or for lunch, and we took a drive last week, and it was amazing. (laughs) Is he married? Not really. Um, What does not really mean? I mean, he's separated, so. Oh. Is this where you think things are headed with you and Jake? I don't know, I, it's complicated. I mean, Annie's not even two yet, and I, I just haven't thought that far ahead. I just know that for the first time in a long time, I feel happy, I feel alive, and I feel, why aren't you saying anything? I, I'm just listening, I'm, okay. I'm taking it all in. This is, this is a lot to digest, and I mean, We were in small group with you and Jake, and honestly, I'm just surprised. Oh, me too. And I'm sorry, is this Camden Street or Bristol? It's Bristol. Bristol. Um, Anyways, do you remember that week in small group where we talked about the verse where God gives you the desires of your heart? Well, I think about that a lot with Ryan. Like maybe God is doing just that, giving me the desires of my heart because he knows that I've needed someone that I really connect with. You know, I think that there's a little bit more to that verse. Yes, being delighted. No. No, um, being delighted in the Lord. Well, that too. And see, God gave you the desires of your heart when he gave you Stephen. You're not stuck with somebody who discusses fertilizer options for the gardens or shipping quotas for the week. Like, he has no idea how boring he is. Uh, well, uh, so, if I am the first person that you told, I, I mean, do you want feedback or... No, no. I, 
I just know that I can keep on with Jake for Annie's sake because I'm gonna have somewhere I go where I feel loved. We went dancing last Friday and it was amazing. So you're having an affair? <sighs> no, we are not sleeping together. Chris, I am in love with him. But you're married. You made an oath before God whom you believe in. It's not just about you. If this is where it is now, where does it end, Susan? What? Tell me this, has he kissed you? Why? He has. I mean, yes, but that is not the same as sleeping together. Oh, it is such a slippery slope to say it's one thing and not the other, believe me. Well, that's easy for you to say when you have somebody like Steven. This is my second marriage. What? I screwed up my first marriage. And I had an affair. I'll call it for what it was. And when it all came out in the open, I caused significant damage to a pretty great guy who divorced me. And that's something that I still struggle with to this day. And I'm still working on forgiving myself. It's by God's grace that I even met Stephen. And by God's grace, and it all worked out. No, I think you're missing the point. I'm sorry, I've, I've gotta go. To see that entire sketch, visit reviveourhearts.com. Find the transcript of this program, and there's a link to the video there. After that drama, my friend Dana Gresh came to the platform to open Titus 2, which exhorts women to be pure. I am not the poster child for purity. Can you identify? Maybe some of you in this room, like me, have spent some of your life not adorned in the gospel, but adorned in a cloak of shame and pain and secrets. So many times the bondage that women experience in their lives are related to the topic of purity, which isn't only about sexuality, but so much of our pain is about sexual impurity. And, and it's not just the world that's broken, it's us. I mean, let me share with you some statistics. One thing that just breaks my heart is that in recent years, erotica, a form of pornography that uses storylines and narrative rather than photos and videos to arouse, has nearly cannibalized the publishing industry. And here's what's sad. There was virtually no statistical difference in the percentage of churched versus unchurched women who read the best-selling title, Fifty Shades of Grey. 64% of men attending our churches say that they use pornography once a month, causing widespread pain to women in the church. And about 40% of the women who have abortions every year have it while they are attending our churches. We are broken. We are wounded. Adultery, divorce, sadly, not as uncommon as it should be in our church. Ladies, here's the problem. We cannot display and adorn ourselves with the gospel when we look as addicted, as broken, as impure, and as ashamed as the rest of the world. They're not going to want what we have if they don't see it working. And so today I want us to dig into Titus. We're going to read verses um, 11 through 14 in chapter 2. And I found three things in here that I think challenge us for this day and age, the condition and the state that we are in with impurity. It reads, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. 
There's three things that God put on my heart as I looked at these few verses that don't seem to be that packed with truth about purity, but oh, they truly are. And the first one is this, purity is a process, not a condition. Purity is a process, not a condition. When I wrote my first book in the year 2000 on the topic of purity, you were a hero in the Christian community if you were talking about purity. Not so much anymore. I get letters all the time asking people, people asking me, could you just not use the word purity? And sometimes they're moms who deeply want their daughters to sit under my teaching or read my books, but they just think the word purity is so irrelevant. I use the word of purity because this book uses the word of purity. And sometimes they say, purity is so outdated. Listen, God's standards about sexuality were never in style. (laughs) But here's the thing that breaks my heart. Many of the women that write to me say, when you use the word purity, it just makes me feel so impure. It hurts me. And so I want to take just a moment to address those hearing my voice this very moment who feel very impure. There's good news for us. The word purity is not synonymous with virginity or abstinence or never having seen pornography. The word purity is not where we begin. Psalm 51 tells us you were born sinful. You may have never been pure. Purity is not something you can lose. It might be something you never had. The Greek word used here in this passage in 2 Timothy, or or Titus, wherever we are. (laughs) Some days I prove I was born blonde. It means pure, clean, without fault, chaste, exciting reverence, sacred. It is a word that came from a word that means holy. You know what that means? It's not just those of us that have been stained by the pain of sexual sin, but every single one of us that should feel overwhelmed at this word when it appears in the pages of Scripture, falling on our faces before God, crying mercy. We should feel We should feel a little uncomfortable, but here's the good news. The good news is this. The way that the, the word purity is used in verses 13 and 14, where it says, Jesus Christ purifies for himself a people. I see two things in that. First, I see it is a process. Jesus purifies us. It's something that's a work that's happening, an ongoing motion, a movement, a direction, a pursuit. It's not a beginning place. It's a process. You might call it sanctification. We have a word for it. But here's the beautiful thing that I see. The second thing, it's not something we ourselves can do. So maybe you just need to stop white knuckling it, friend. You are never gonna stop that thing. You are never going to say no to that person. Aside from setting yourself in the presence of Jesus, Jesus purifies us. It's his work in our lives. You must put your sweet, broken heart in his hands to do this work. You cannot do it yourself. And that brings me to the second point. I feel really, really strongly about this. If we are to succeed in training ourselves and others to live in purity, we must foster communities dominated by God's grace not the rules about sex. Impurity grows in an environment dominated by rules. Let me share with you some startling realities. While most church-going men who are regular in attendance are slightly less likely to look at porn than the unchurched, men who self-identify as, and this survey used a specific word, a specific sect of our evangelical churches that if I said it today, many of you would equate with legalism. Men who attended those churches are 91% more likely to look at porn than unchurched men. 
There's a traceable link between legalism and isolation that feeds sexual secrets. Women were not off the hook. Only 7% of women who had an abortion while attending church felt there was one person that they could talk to in their churches about their dilemma. Only 7% of the women in our churches. I can only imagine what would happen if we would foster a community of grace so that these women felt like when they found themselves in a crisis pregnancy, they could come to just one of us. Ladies, how many of those babies could we have saved? A commitment to life mandates that we foster an environment of grace for women found in crisis pregnancies. And here is something that our world is really struggling with and we really need to deal with in the church. According to a recent research, 73% of gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgendered individuals felt the Christian church was unfriendly toward them. What would happen if we started creating a safe place for our brothers and sisters struggling in this area by admitting that the ground at the foot of the cross is level? There is no worse sin. None. Paul instructs in this verse, in verse 11, he says, the grace of God trains us to renounce ungodliness and live self-controlled, upright, godly lives. Now, I'm not talking about cheap grace. He's not talking about cheap grace. He's talking about grace that's strong enough to carry the truth, but gentle enough to hear a confession. Do we have that in our churches? We, I think we're very quick to instruct the thou shalt not flow quickly off of our lips. But are we quick to confess our own struggles so that we can create an environment of grace declaring that the ground at the foot of the cross truly is level? The word here for grace It's not spoken without solid access to truth. But Paul could not think of Christian truth and conduct outside of God's grace. They were tightly woven together. Ladies, I want to tell you how Bob and I have attempted to create an environment of grace for our own children in our home. We tell them about our past. We told them about our sin. I remember when I took my oldest son, Robbie, in eighth grade out for ice cream to tell him about my past because girls in his class had begun reading my book on purity and I knew that he might hear my story before I could tell him. And I just simply said, Robbie, I want to tell you why I love talking and teaching on the subject of purity. It's because when I was a teenager, I did not walk in purity And I know how much it hurts. And I don't want other people to know that hurt. But if they do, I want them to find the healing of Jesus much faster than I did. And in all of my sweet Robbie, oh, he's a teddy bear of a... uh, mm. (laughs) But he sat there in all of his eighth grade awkwardness, not knowing what to say. And I said, Robbie, I kind of need to know what's going through your head right now. And he looked at me and he just simply said, Mom, that's why Jesus died for you. Mm. Create an environment of grace in your home. I truly believe that creating an environment of grace in our home is what has given our children permission to come to us before they're too deep in. But when you, when you have grace, it trains you for godliness. It trains you for purity. And I want to tell you how that kind of has unfolded in my life. You see, when I was several years into marriage, I finally realized that I had to stop waking up in the morning with that terrible ache in my heart of thinking, um, the, you know, the world is okay, the world is good. Maybe there was sun shining through my bedroom. Maybe I heard birds singing. I don't know, but I felt like everything was good. And yet, maybe there's something not right. Oh, yeah, that. It was always on my mind. It feels really bad. To save a shameful secret and keep it from the one you are supposed to be one with. 
And so in a dark bedroom, it took me three hours. There's dark because I, I would not let Bob turn the light on. I, did, I was still so ashamed, I couldn't let him see my face. But I finally got the words out. And when I did, my husband held me. Not at all what I expected, by the way. And for the first time in 10 years of confessing my sin to God, I felt Christ's forgiveness. I felt it. And he said, I don't, I don't think I need to say this, honey, but I think you need to hear this. I forgive you. And it felt like the voice of God in my ears, ladies. You see, forgiveness comes from confession to God and God alone. But healing, God's word tells us, James 5, 16, confess your sins one to another and then you will be healed. The work of healing and the work of working out the grace in our lives, that's what happens in the community of our Christian fellowship. And I felt it in a big way that, when, and when, a few weeks later, I confessed to my mom, and I remember the, the grace just pouring out in my heart as she encouraged me and loved me. And it didn't turn into less of ministry in my life, but more. I didn't attend a school to start a ministry on sexual purity. No one said, you should write a book on sexual purity. God's grace trained me and made me so enthusiastic and so excited. And when his grace poured into my heart, suddenly, as if the blinders had been taken off, I could see the shame in the eyes of other women. I could see that invisible cloak of hiding and grief and pain. And when I walked up to them, it was as if they could see the grace of God all over me. And their tears would flow and their stories would come out. I never asked for that. But God's grace trained me for it. I have a, mi a ministry on the front lines of the HIV AIDS pandemic in Zambia that Bob and I had the privilege of starting several years ago. God's opened up my heart to a little tiny valley in the Dominican Republic called Harabacoa that the United Nations says has the highest rate of teen pregnancy for girls aged 13 to 15. And I'm believing myself and 72 Dominicans, I don't know how I got invited to the party. I'm believing Believing. I am believing that we, through God's grace, can turn one of the devil's playgrounds into a story of God's grace. I was trained by grace. That's the seminary I went to. Which brings me to my final point. The most important thing we teach about purity is the purpose of it, which is to showcase the gospel Verse 14, look at it, tells us why Jesus takes us through the process of purifying us. It is to redeem a people for his possession who are zealous for good works. If you're not zealous for good works, I may suggest you have not fully tasted of the grace that he has for your life. Because once, if, if it sounds like pride when I talk about the work we're doing in Zambia and the Dominican Republic and, and all the wonderful books God's entrusted to me to write, you do not understand what it's like to live in the pit. I'm not bragging on myself. I am saying God's grace is so big. And when it shows up in your life, it pops out of your life and you just can't help but do good things. Ladies, here's why we have to, have to understand the purpose. When, when our lives are, are marred by scandal and sin, that's what people talk about. They can't see the adornment of the gospel in our lives. And ladies, some of you are hiding in your silence and your shame and you think, well, I can't let my sin be known because then it would be a scandal. I am telling you that you are believing a lie from the enemy because God wants you to have the full redemption, the full healing, so that your life is a testimony. I once was, but now I am. It's not just after your healing that good works pop out of you, but the very purpose of sex and marriage is so integral to the gospel story. Paul said it most concisely in Ephesians 5, 31 and 32, which reads, Therefore, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, 
and the two will become one flesh. And then it's almost as if the Apostle Paul has ADD or something. Because he's talking about the marriage relationship, the one flesh relationship. And then the next verse says, this is a mystery, but I'm really talking about Christ and the church. From Genesis to Revelation, we are told again and again that this world is going to get so lost in its sin that it's not going to understand God's love. And so in Genesis, at the point of creation, God said, I'm going to paint a picture so they don't forget And that picture is one man and one woman in shameless oneness, in a pure and holy marriage relationship. This is the picture that God says when they forget, they will turn to this and they will mysteriously see the love and the passion that Jesus has for his bride, the church. Ladies, if that is true, and I know that it is, How motivated do you think Satan is to see this picture destroyed in your life? I beg you, run. Don't walk. Don't say, I'll do it tomorrow. Run to your nearest Christian sister. Confess your sins. Be completely needy of Jesus. And let him pour his comfort into you so that you can be trained in the school of grace. Because this matters. Father God, train us. We place ourselves in your presence with broken hearts and broken lives, children and husbands who are broken by the enemy's plan for sexuality. And we beg you to bring us to your school of grace by first making us courageous to confess our sins one to another in an environment of grace. We ask this in the precious name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And everybody said, amen. That's my good friend, Dana Gresh, sharing wisdom from God's word and from her own experience about the importance of purity. That message was based on Titus 2, as were the other messages from the conference. We're reviewing those messages in our current series, Living Out the Beauty of the Gospel Together. You know, we're able to air practical biblical teaching like this because of listeners like you who support this program financially. Do you appreciate hearing truth like this? Do you want to be involved in helping to pass this truth on to other women who need to hear it? When you give a gift of any size to Revive Our Hearts, we'd like to send you the book I've written on Titus 2 called adorned. Yes, and Nancy's book will give you a more in-depth look at woman-to-woman discipleship. And your gift to support this ministry helps us put the beauty of the gospel on display for women around the world. Request your copy of Adorned, Living Out the Beauty of the Gospel Together when you visit ReviveOurHearts.com or call us at 1-800-569-5959. Well, you might know me as Dana, but to my precious grandchildren, I'm Nana Dana, one word. And I am up to four grandbabies, Addie and Zoe, the twins that so many of you prayed for five years ago, Stella Bella, she's two, and our first boy, Theo, is one. I feel like I'm still learning to grandparent, and that's why I'm really excited about the brand new email challenge from Revive Our Hearts called Grandparenting on Purpose. It starts today, September 23rd. If you're a grandparent, have you given much thought to the way you grandparent? Grandchildren are such a gift, and my husband thought about this ahead of time and decided many years ago that we would devote a significant amount of time to leaving a legacy of faith in them, and we share about that intentional commitment in one of the emails in Grandparenting on Purpose. We want to encourage you to be intentional with how you grandparent. In this series, you'll get real-life wisdom from grandparents who have found biblical ways to invest in the next generation. Sign up today at ReviveOurHearts.com to start receiving daily emails for the next 10 days to help you grandparent on purpose. Tomorrow, we'll hear from Betsy Gomez, who was a young, up-and-coming marketing executive who thought she was taking care of her son because she'd hired a full-time nanny. 
Well, her world came to a halt when she read three words in Titus chapter 2. Find out what those words were next time on Revive Our Hearts. This program is a listener-supported production of Revive Our Hearts in Niles, Michigan, calling women to freedom, fullness, and fruitfulness in Christ.